Good morning, everybody. Ooh, that's loud. Eh? Thank you. You'll hear me all right. <laughs> uh, let's just have a word of prayer before we start. Dear Father, thank you so much that we can open your word, that we can discuss how you work in experiences through people's lives. And we pray you would bless each one of us. May your spirit speak to our hearts and tell us what we need to do, who we need to be, and then he'll give us the power. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I took a sermon, part one of this message. It was called Clean and Right Side Up. Is that ringing for you? It's a little bit loud for me. I don't know. Is that all right? Um, and this week is part two, and it's provocatively called... God hates blue eyes. I don't see it on the screen. Is there any reason for that? Should it be there? Big pardon? Hasn't come through. Oh. Let me go back. That's why it hasn't come through. Good. Okay. There we go. Got it. So it's provocatively called God Hates Blue Eyes. I could have had it as a positive provocative title, but you'll see this title fits and you'll understand why as we go along. In that last sermon, I mentioned that this message was based on Pavel Goya's experiences and this one is based on his experiences as well. There won't be so, many, so much of a Bible uh, discussion, but I want to target experiences that highlight how God works in people's lives. And Pavel doesn't have a monopoly on messages about prayer, but he does have amazing experiences. So I encourage you to listen to his sermons, especially on prayer and preparing for the second coming. And also he has a new book out called In the Spirit and Power. Has anybody got this and read it? Okay, because I'm taking most of the experiences from this book today. Not all of them, because I don't want to spoil it for you, but I thoroughly recommend you get this book, um, as well as his first one, Life-Changing Stuff. So a few questions. Why don't we have more power in our spiritual lives and in our church today? How can we prepare for Jesus' soon return if we are so lacking in spiritual power, we can't, is the short answer. Could a large part of the answer be in the way we pray? How do we pray? How does God answer? How do we know it's God's voice and not our own thoughts? They're good questions and they're on a lot of people's lips as we realise our need for Jesus. So this morning we'll look at some of his experiences and we're talking about being in prayer. Some of you may say, well, I know how to pray. I've been praying for years. And that's true. We are generally very familiar with what we call prayer. But maybe to such an extent that we've lost our focus and lost its purpose. And as you know, prayer is speaking to someone who is invisible it's a dialogue, not a monologue, a dialogue. And its purpose is to change us, to prepare us for God's plan. Not to change God or get answers or support for our plans. Prayer is to focus on Jesus' presence and power and his faithfulness to us. Now you'll see I have a number of these stories and they are I think amazing the wind was frigid 
And Pavel and his wife, Daniela, stood waiting in a long queue uh, at Andrews University as this old man handed out tin food to poor students. They got the food, they went home, they were freezing, they were hungry, they'd fasted for five days because every bit of food they had went to their children and expenses were high and income was low. They were working two jobs, they were struggling and they weren't coping too well. They'd been in the US for about two years. Pavel was trying to cram in a three-year study program into one, one and a half years. And he was having lectures in Greek and Hebrew from English professors while he was still learning English himself and that was a struggle. Tuition and books were expensive as were housing, insurance, food, clothing and all the other stuff. You know what it's like when you first start out. And then they received a letter from the school housing department that said, pay your rent by the end of the week or we'll evict you. Then he received a letter from the school saying he couldn't register for the next semester unless he paid the tuition in full. They prayed for God to intervene and nothing happened. Nothing happened. They prayed, Lord, this is our problems. We need help. And they took their burdens back with them when they finished praying. They looked for answers and their problems just seemed to multiply. They went to bed defeated and powerless. In the morning they got up and they had worship and they read from Deuteronomy chapter 4 and I'm sure they read this verse. And they realised that God wanted Moses to write down these things so they could be repeated to their children, their grandchildren and believers in all ages to come to remember what God had done how he had led next they read from another inspired book and they read this we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the lord has led us and his teaching in our past history and they were quiet the spirit was speaking to them then they decided to stop focusing on their trials and instead turn their focus on jesus his love his promises and his amazing ways and leading up to that point. The more they talked this way, the more peace and courage they received. And the text says, don't forget any of his benefits. And then Pavel thought, I've got some classmates who are struggling. And they have worse struggles than I have. And he remembered seven of his colleagues. One of them his wife just passed away. Another one, both parents were killed in a car accident. So they decided to visit each one, praying with them, sharing with them promises and encouraging them. And when they came home, their prayers were transformed. They were no longer hungry for physical food. Instead of praying for food or physical help, they were praying for God to fill them with the Holy Spirit, to make them fresh and new and every morning baptise them afresh to be like Jesus and be a blessing to other people. Still they placed their knees before God, but they also thanked him for the many provisions and for expressing, and expressing faith that he would continue to care for them. They also prayed for these other families. It was the first time in many days that they felt real peace. They were still hungry. That night, man knocked on their door, never seen him before, and he said, uh, can you fix my jacket? Where's the lady who does the mending? Oh, she doesn't live here anymore. He was disappointed. And Pavel said, my wife can fix it. We used to make clothing. So he said, great, here's 20 bucks. So Pavel's eyes lit up. He rushed down to the grocer while his wife was fixing the jacket, bought food, and trotted home eating with a big grin on his face. You know, he has to eat every four or five hours, otherwise he's dying. Well, this bloke was still there when he got back, and he saw Pavel eating, and he said, man, you must have been hungry. I've got a bootload of eight boxes of produce from my farm. God's blessed me. Can you use it? Pavel said, well, we sure can use it. Thank you very much. And there was a loaf of bread as well from this guy's bakery. So... They fell to their knees and thanked God for this food 
And Pavel wanted to start eating straight away, but his wife said, nope, let's divide everything up equally into eight boxes. We keep one box and we take a box to each of those seven families. And that's what they did. And the joy in the eyes of those families was just blessing enough for them. But they were delighted. Um, when he got home from the delivery, a good friend from Tennessee rang Pavel and said, how are you doing? And Pavel fobbed it off. He said, yeah, we're doing fine. And the friend didn't believe him. So the friend rang the housing department and said, what's happening? How are they faring? And he learnt they were behind on their rent, so he paid that rent and he paid three months in advance. The next day, Pavel went to the school to plead his case if he could pay for his semester's tuition at the end of the semester. And they said to him this, no need. Your tuition has been paid in full for the entire year by an anonymous person who wanted to pass on God's blessing to others. He arrived back to the apartment, checked the letterbox, and inside was an envelope with cash in it, the exact amount they owe the electricity company. They told no one about their challenges, let alone how much they owed. And the lessons... God went above and beyond whatever they could have hoped for. God calls us to put aside ourselves and pray for the Holy Spirit so that we can truly know him. The more we know him, the more we love him, the more we trust him. And the closer we get to him, the closer he gets to us. And the more we become one, he lives in us. And instead of hungering to resolve our physical needs, we must hunger for his presence, for his spirit. And this quote came to their mind. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. Not partly me and partly God, wholly consecrated to God. Another story. After graduating from the seminary at Andrews, Pavel became a pastor of a multi-church region. In one of the churches was a lady called Martha. Martha was amazing. She was energetic. She had lots of ideas and she knew how to get them done. And she talked even more than Pavel and that's pretty amazing. The town was small, they tried to evangelise it, but no one came to their creaky little old church. No baptisms, it was hard times. People were more interested in getting an income, putting food on their tables and surviving. So Pavel preached about prayer to the members. He told them prayer was the way to connect to our source of power. He told them that the more they prayed, the more they'd hear God's voice and know God's plan for their church. They needed God's plan if they were to have his blessing and power and do anything successfully. He quoted Hezekiah, sorry, Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Also, he said that the Holy Spirit and revival come as a result of dedicated prayer, not snatches here and there. Martha came to him after the sermon and said, I want God's vision for our church. How do I hear God's voice? How do I listen when I pray? And Pavel explained, you pray a little and then you listen a little. You be silent for a few seconds. He may speak, he may not. But still be silent. Wait quietly and give him a chance. Don't tell him when to talk. That's up to him. Just wait. Pray, think, study. Pray and study God's word. Prayer and study God's word always go together. They're not separate. Through prayer, we talk to God. And he talks to us through his word. Prayer should be a conversation. Digest what we study, then reflect on it. God, what do you mean by this? Maybe this means that. It could also mean this. Thank you for what I'm reading. Thank you for convicting me. God promised wisdom and his spirit to those who ask him. Then you pray again. You read a little bit and you think about it. 
you keep praying, you keep reading, you keep thinking. And finally, you make yourself available to do what God asks of you. Then listen and watch for opportunities. Pray, think, pray, read, think, make ourselves available. And when God calls, you will know. A few weeks later, Martha called Pavel and said, God talked to her, but why did it take so long? This is an important point. Pavel said, because he had to prepare you, Martha, for what he has in store. If he answered at the beginning, you wouldn't have been ready. But how do we know God's voice? Should we be able to hear God's voice in our head? Well, Pavel says yes. If we don't hear voices in our head, God's voice, then we're not real Christians. He said spiritualists hear voices. They speak to the spirits and they're proud of it. Shouldn't we, who know the true living God, be proud that God speaks to us? And he speaks to us in lots of different ways. Look at this verse. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth forth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And this one, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. God wants to speak to us. He wants us to be available and listening. Abraham, Noah, Joseph all talk to God. Why did they and why don't we? Pavel suggests that if we pray duty prayers, it's my duty, if we don't spend time in God's word, we may not know the difference between his voice and our thoughts. We need to spend time with him. Spending time in dedicated prayer and God's word makes us sensitive to God's leading. The more we do that, pray and study, the more we know him and how he works. The more we study and discover how he's worked in the past, the more we can see his leading now. God is consistent. He doesn't change his methods. How do we know God's voice? Keep talking to him about everything. The more we talk and listen through prayer and study of the word, the more we know him and the more we understand his message and his voice. Also, our thoughts tend to follow what we like things that are comfortable for us. God's plans are much, much bigger than our plans and can be uncomfortable sometimes. Think of Abraham going to a far country. He sent Moses to Pharaoh, Elijah to Ahab. He asked Joshua to walk around Jericho and Gideon to go to war with only 300 people and no weapons. God's plans are bigger than ours. God knows the plans he has for us The problem is we don't know them. To do his will, we need to first know what it is. And to know his will, we need to listen and make ourselves available. Then, what do we need to do? Obey it. Not just go, "Uh uh-uh, not for me. Well, God honors that too. Then we don't hear his voice and we have no power. But if we listen, make ourselves available, and obey his plan, he will be a power in our lives. And your, your spiritual life will be amazing. Back to the story. Martha said to Pavel, I know what God wants us to do. He impressed me that we will never reach the people in our town by doing evangelism and Bible studies alone. We need to feed them. They're hungry. We need to help them. We need to build relationships. Then we can lead them to Jesus. We need to have a community center. And Pavel was wary. Yes? What does that mean? What's the implication there? Well, we need a building, food, furniture, clothing, anything that people need, anything they use. If they need a table, we give them a table. We pray for them. We build relationships. Pavel said, good on you, Martha. Go and do it. And she said, "Uh uh-uh, I need your help. And he said, what do you want me to do? And she said to him, I want you to come and help me look for a building. And he said, okay, Thursday morning, I'll give you half an hour. She said, what, half an hour? 
We need to go business to business, door to door, place to place to search for something that's suitable. He said, okay, three hours, 9 to 12 this Thursday. So that's what they did. They went door to door, place to place. They could spend two and a half grand a month on rent. That's all they had. The cheapest place was $4,000. And most of them were terrible. They were either run down, too small, leaky, or way too expensive. They got to the end of the day, and Pavel said, Okay, Martha, we tried. I guess we'll pray some more and see what happens. God bless you. And she beamed and said, Okay, Pastor, I'll see you next Thursday. And he said, uh, 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 No, 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 no. One Thursday, singular, not plural. And she said, Pastor. You taught in the prayer seminar that we need to be persistent. You said that if we want God to give us a blessing, we need not to try one time and then give up. We need to be dedicated and diligent. You said that we need to mean it with all our heart. Pavel's thinking, oh boy, she's listened to my sermons better than I have. So guess what happened next Thursday? They went again together and again and again and again every Thursday. They finished the town. Pavel said, well, Martha, looks like we don't have anywhere else to go. We tried everywhere. And she said, see you next Thursday, Pastor. We'll go to the next town. Maybe God wants us to evangelize there. So they went to the next town, knocked on the doors every Thursday morning, nothing. Came back to the first town And to his dismay, Martha wanted to redo the first town. And he said, why? And she said, maybe something just opened up. And he said, Martha, are you sure God told you this? And she said, Pastor, I ask myself every night why God hasn't given us a location and why it's taking so long. And he keeps impressing me to be persistent, keep knocking and don't doubt I remember that you said we don't need to understand to obey God. Get that? We don't need to understand. You said we could not understand why God says to build an ark or walk around Jericho. And if we were to try to understand, we will never obey. You said we just need to trust him and keep on going. In your sermon, you even sang a few words of the song, Trust and Obey. You said the answer to prayer, that answer to prayer is usually not an event, but a process. Not an event, but a process. That God has to prepare us for his plan and prepare others and prepare the place. And we need to keep praying and working. Remember what you said? Those who wait upon the Lord. So we need to wait for God's timing, Pastor. See you next Thursday, Pastor. Pavel began to feel bad that he actually hadn't prayed enough. So his prayers began to change and he kept going with her door to door. First town, second town again. Martha never lost her faith, never got tired, never lost her commitment, kept smiling and kept searching. Let's keep going, she said every time. How long, Pavel eventually said, And pastor, she would say, you said to pray and go until you have an answer. Until you have an answer. One Thursday, they returned to a business they'd visited several months earlier. Great location. But the owner wanted 4500 per month. Not a penny less, he said the first time. Now he recognized them straight away. And he said, oh, I've seen you before. Didn't you come a few months ago? Yes. You've got two and a half grand to pay. Yes. And I want four and a half. Pavel said, yeah, we haven't got that. And he said, what, do you, what business do you want to start? And he, Pavel didn't say, because Martha jumped in and said, oh, we don't want to start a business. We want to open a community centre to help the community. And the business owner said, wow, that's great. You are doing good work. You know what? The economy has dropped. I can't rent the space out. I might as well get two and a half grand as nothing. It's yours. You can have it. Pastor said, praise the Lord. I don't have to go out next Thursday. 
and he signed the papers on the spot. Then, as soon as his pen left the page of the contract, his phone rang. He didn't recognize the number. Are you Pastor Goya? Yes, he said cautiously. I'm the general manager of Kmart. We're closing our store and I was wondering if you'd like our shelving for your community centre. Pavel was shocked. He said, how did you know we were starting a community centre? He asked. And the general manager said, everybody knows you were starting a community centre. You've been knocking on doors for months. And then it dawned on Pavel. The whole town now knew that a little Seventh-day Adventist church was starting a community centre to help people. Pavel began to understand that God allowed them to keep knocking on doors until the community learned about them and their plans. The shelves wouldn't all fit in the centre, so the surplus was put in the parking area at the back of the building. Clothes and donations poured in. Churches from other denominations began calling, wanting to be involved, and heading up drives among their own members for clothes and furniture. There is more to the story. haven't got time to share it. It's in the book. Get the book. It's a fabulous read. But the lessons are these. Persist in prayer. Commit to prayer. Plan, read, think, repeat. Listen for God's voice. Make ourselves available. Watch for opportunities. Trust him. Allow him to prepare you and others for his plans. Be fully committed to knowing and doing God's plan. And the stories go on. That was only the beginning. Pastor, we don't believe in evangelism in this church. We've tried. We've spent the money. We've lined up good speakers. It just doesn't work in this city. Pavel got this at his first board meeting at this new church. Another person said, we've tried to give Bible studies, we've held seminars, no one came. This city is affluent. Half of them are extremely rich, the other half go to other churches and believe they're already saved. There's no way to do evangelism in this city. It may work in different places, but not here. So where does it work? Is evangelism a human invention? Is it? No. No. God's invention. Remember this text? And it's a command. It's not, well, if you feel like it. Go teach, baptize, a command. If it doesn't work, can it be that we just need to revise how we do it? Well, Pavel and Daniela began to pray for God's plan for this city every morning, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. It's a long time to pray. But they prayed for specifics. They prayed for every individual church member by name and their family, their health, their work. They prayed for each church department and the leaders by name. They prayed for God's vision. When you pray specifically, it takes time. It takes commitment. And you start knowing each person and you, wanting, you, want, you begin to want to see changes in their lives. Too often we pray anemically. We don't put our heart into it. And when we pray small prayers, you know what sort of answers we get? Small answers. When we pray big prayers, we get big answers because our God is a big God. And we must exercise faith. Praise the Lord in faith for what he will do. Pavel says God had to work on him and his wife first they had to pray enough to make sure that they would obey when God gave them his plan isn't that interesting that was a revelation to me prayer is to get me ready for God's plan and you ready for God's plan and God had to work with the members and with the city it takes time it takes commitment they prayed with the members as well and after three months Pavel had a miraculous answer to the prayer at a camp meeting. I won't go into the details. Again, it's in the book. 
But he went to the board meeting and he said, God has spoken to me. And they said, what's the plan? And he said, no, 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 no. You need to pray for one month between now and the next board meeting and let God speak to you. Otherwise, you'll think it's just my plan. You need to have God speak to you. Then it's your plan as well. One month went by. He kept ringing them and praying with them. Next board meeting, a couple of the board members said, yeah, we think God's spoken to us. Is this the plan? And he said, yes. Then Pavel shared the bigger picture. And the board said, yep, we'll do it. And the results, church attendance almost tripled. Member involvement went from 15% to 85%. Baptism retention rate rose to above 80%. They gave 200 to 250 Bible studies per year because they followed God's plan as a result of prayer. And they're only the parts of the story. There's more. But I want to share three more stories. A walk in the forest, the Federal Communications Commission, and lastly, God hates blue eyes. That's the one you've been waiting for. It's the last one. A walk in the forest. This same leadership team from this church, Pavel used to have to his place every so often for fellowship and prayer and planning. And this time they were planning for the future, five years. So he said, go into the bush and pray to God that he'll tell you what the plans are for the next five years. And he said, make sure they're big plans because God is a big God and he wants to have do big things through people. So they went away. They came back in an hour or two. Most of them had trickled back. They were quiet. They were subdued. They wrote out what God had told them on bits of paper and gave them to Pavel. And this was his reaction. Friends, I asked you to write out a vision for how our church can reach the community, but you are going far beyond that. You are way too broad, way too large, too big. This is too much. Look at all these things you write down. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, radio station in two languages. Meetings and seminars for the community at least six times a year. Everyone giving Bible studies, mission trips, evangelism with a worldwide impact, canvassing every year, access to local TV. We can't do all that. We don't have the people. We don't have the money. It's way above our budget and our scope. And the leader said, Pavel, you told us to trust God. You told us to listen to him. You told us to pray big and this is what he told us. And he said, no. He pulled rank and they said, we'll do three things. We'll start small and we'll work up. They were discouraged. They stopped arguing and they left. Next day, Pavel went on a trip for a speaking engagement and he took the first meeting at night then he went home, went got back to his unit or motel, whatever it was, And he was restless. He wasn't at peace. He couldn't sleep. He woke up and he said, Lord, if there's something between you and me, you need to tell me and I'll confess. I'll ask forgiveness and I'll repent. I'll fix it. And in his thoughts, God said this, and I'll I'll quote it. God answered, you asked the people to pray. I gave them the vision and you opposed me. You sent them into the forest to pray, but you did not pray. Instead, you worked in the kitchen preparing the meal. The plans they provided were from me. And you were the one opposing the vision instead of supporting it. Imagine how Pavel felt. He felt terrible. He immediately said sorry, asked for forgiveness, said he'll go to the church next time he's there and confess and and, and seek their forgiveness. But more importantly, Pavel said, God, I don't know how to do these plans. They're too big. They're too big. At that point, he went to check his emails and he had a glass of water beside his laptop and he bumped it over and it fell on his mobile phone. You might have heard this story, but it's good to hear it again. His mobile phone, you know what you do, and it was a while ago, so he took the battery out and hair dryer over it and put it in rice and absorbed the water out of it as much as he could. No go. The phone was dead. Didn't work. So he rang his wife on a borrowed phone just to keep in touch, went back to his room and was praying there thinking about 
what had happened and how he could do all this stuff and said, God, you've got to do this. We can't do this list. And his dead phone rang. And he picked it up and went, hello? Pastor Pavel, I am not a member of your church, the voice on the other end said, but I live nearby. Some time ago, God put on my heart to start a radio station. But my church is too small and your church is larger and more active. So I want to offer you everything we have, the building, money for equipment, the tower, everything. We will donate it to your church if you're willing to start a radio station. Pavel was stunned. He couldn't believe it. He tried to call his wife on that phone, but of course it was dead. No go. While he was praising God for the miracle of the radio station, suddenly the phone rang again, his dead phone. Hello, Pavel. It was a conference literature evangelist coordinator. You said your church wants to do canvassing every year. We're going to work with your church for free. We will send students from the academy, provide the books. There will be no expense to your church except to give them food and lodging. Then the phone rang again, the dead phone. The lady on the line said, I am the general manager from the local TV, cable TV. I've been listening to some of your sermons online and seminars. I think they would be a blessing to our city. We need good programs in our city. I'm offering you four hours free programming each week if you want it. Pavel praised the Lord. His mobile phone was still dead. It never worked again. The next Sabbath he stood up in church, confessed his sin, saying, We prayed, God gave you a vision, and I got in the way. I'm sorry. Then he told them the miracles God was doing. But that was only the beginning. You know, they had to get a license to run this radio station. They had the building, they had the equipment, they had the tower. They didn't have a license. Getting a license from the FCC was a challenge. Lots of money, very competitive. The application cost 24,000 US dollars. Pavel said, I'll give you three months to raise it. The next week, They had over $56,000. When God comes, money and resources also come. Now the application. You have to apply in a competitive process and there were four licenses, there were four frequencies available in the area and 16 organisations were applying for them. They prayed, God had blessed them, they felt confident. The licenses were awarded on a point system for benefit for the community. For example, you scored more points if you used your radio station to announce something like um, emergency weather alerts, things like that. And they realised there were lots of other groups that had f- were going to get far more points than them. But they prayed, they were confident. You know where two or three agree together? God will answer that prayer. Well, in June they received a letter from the FCC and guess what? They were rejected. And they were disheartened. How come? They were confused. All this leading to be rejected. And once you're rejected, you can't apply for years So they were were really discouraged. Pavel said, no, no, no. He likes to say no, no, no a lot. (laughs) We can't doubt God when we face a hiccup. In the Bible, nothing goes easy for those who follow God. Satan attacks. And if he doesn't, then you have to wonder if you're following God's will. God allows trials to increase our faith. Just keep praying. So they did. They kept praying. In August... A few months later, they received another letter from the FCC requesting the church withdraw their failed application and Pavel advised the board not to withdraw it. He reasoned that God gave the vision and resources. He will sort out the approval. Keep on praying. So they kept on praying. August, September, October, November and it came to mid-December. They received yet another letter from the FCC strange 
the machine used in June to calculate the number of frequencies available had malfunctioned. It had improperly stated there were four frequencies available in their area when in fact there were five available. And since everyone else who had been rejected had withdrawn their application months earlier, theirs was the only application left and so they got the licence. Isn't that amazing? They had their radio station. Pavel says you should have seen the celebration when they heard that news. If the FCC had known there were five licences back in June, Pavel's church wouldn't have got it. Someone else was already ahead on points. But because they had left their application in and the mistake was discovered, they got their licence. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in two languages. God hates blue eyes. This is a lovely story, and it's part of this same church. One of the rules they had in this church was you pray with everyone who comes through the door. And visitors used to say this was the most friendly, loving, caring, praying church ever. But one Sabbath morning, when Pavel was preaching, someone slipped in the back door in the back pew. Then as the last hymn was being sung, she snuck out. And he said her hair was like this picture, a multicolored, a kaleidoscope of color. So what Pavel did was he bolted down the hall, down the aisle of the church during the hymn and out to the car park. I don't know what the members thought about that, but he didn't care. And he saw she was just about to get in the car, so he sprinted across to her and she saw him coming. And she said, I know you're the pastor. I don't want to talk, she said. Okay, then I'll talk. And then she said, I don't believe in God. Leave me alone. And he knew if he said, oh, please believe in God, he would get nowhere with her. So he, he said he had to convince her. He would never convince her, sorry. She had to convince herself. So instead, he had to shock her so she would argue with herself. So he said, you're drunk. She said, what? Imagine being accused. You just got out of church. You're drunk. What? I am not drunk. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Why do you say that? Because you say you do not believe in God, but you came to church. Why would you be in church if you didn't believe in God, unless you were drunk, missed your destination, or walked in by chance? Then she gave a chuckle. And she said, okay, I get your point. I do believe in God, but I just don't believe in prayer, so don't offer to pray with me or try to convince me to trust in God. He knew she was expecting him to say, oh yes, God answers prayer, please let me pray for you. Instead, you know what he said? Instead, he said, I know why you don't believe in prayer. It's because you have blue eyes. God hates blue eyes. He turns away from people with blue eyes. If you had brown eyes like mine, he would hear you when you pray. But God hates blue eyes. Her jaw dropped. <laughs> and she said, that is the craziest thing I have ever heard. And you're wrong. God answers any person's prayer, regardless of the color of their eyes. He loves Everyone. And Pavel said, aha. First you say you don't believe in prayer. Now you tell me that God answers every prayer. Make up your mind. And she smiled. And she said, well, okay, well, you cornered me. And she said, look, okay, I believe in prayer, theoretically, but I struggle. I don't get answers to my prayers. And Pavel said, explain. She said, I've been doing drugs for 16 years showed him the marks. Every two hours I do drugs. If I don't, I start shaking and I drop. I've been in jail, in rehab, I've prayed. God never answers my prayers. Over and over, I'd say, Lord Jesus, I'm a drug addict. Forgive me, save me, please. I can't stop doing drugs. I love drugs. I'm dependent on drugs. And I keep confessing, asking for forgiveness. 
telling God my problems again and again with no answer. You know what Pavel said? You're praying the wrong prayer. What do you mean, she said. You focus on sin instead of focusing on Jesus. After you confess your sin, God forgives you. That's a promise. If you confess, he forgives, period. There's no need to confess it again. It's gone. But it's not enough to be forgiven. You must also grow. You need to stay in God's presence. From now on, you need to focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Stay with him. Focus on his goodness, his promises, his power, his sacrifice. Talk about him, not about sin. Don't dwell on sin. And she said, okay, I have never prayed that way. He said, well, it's time you started. She said, what's going to happen? He said, you'll see, let God work. He'll do what you cannot do. But there's another thing. Yeah, what's that? You need to give a Bible study. What? I don't know how to give a Bible study. I can't teach. Good, don't teach. So why would I give a Bible study? What's the connection with drug addiction? And Pavel said, you need to grow. You need to follow God's plan for you. This is important. Listen to this carefully. God has plans for you daily. And as long as you follow his plans, you keep growing. The single way to grow is to serve him, to follow him daily. Follow his leading, his plans. Then he can work in you and with you. When you serve him, you focus on him. You stay with him. You are, you are busy working with him. And as you serve, you grow. As you serve, you grow. And she asked him how to give a Bible study. And he said, go to the door, give the DVD and the study, then leave. Second time, you ask the question when you go to the door and give them the DVD and Bible study, how are you going? Third time, you pray for them. What do I say, she said. Say, God bless you and protect them. God bless them and protect them, and that's it. Fourth time, you go inside and you watch the DVD with them. You're no longer a stranger. You want to build friendships. And she said, well, okay, I guess I can do that. But what he said, and she said to him, so you're saying if I give Bible studies, I will grow and have victory over drugs? He said, yes. She said, what if I don't get victory? I'll never come back here. And he said, that's fine. And he went, got a Bible study, got a DVD, and got an address. And he said, here, go. And she went. That was it. It was 12.15 p.m. Fifteen minutes later, Pavel got a call. Hello? I hate you, she said. I hate the church too, and I'm never coming back. Okay, tell me why. Well, the address you gave me for the Bible study is an apartment building. I have to ring a bell and they have to answer and no one's answering. I'm standing here at the door, nobody's home. God doesn't consider me worthy to give a Bible study and get me free from drugs. Pavel said, that's the reason you hate me? Did you pray that God would open the door so you could give a Bible study? Uh, I didn't think about that. You need to pray. Okay, she hung up. A few minutes later, the phone rang in. Hello? I prayed. The door didn't open. He said, sister, when did you pray? I didn't even have time to put the mobile phone in my pocket. Well, I prayed quickly. (laughs) Pavel said, that's not prayer. Small prayers, small answers. Big prayers, big answers. You need to mean it. How long do I have to pray? Five minutes until the door opens, he said. Ten minutes until the door opens. He said, one hour, listen, lady, until the door opens. Keep praying until it's evening or morning or you get old or you die praying, Pavel said. Then he said, look, I'll pray with you. I won't go home. I won't eat. I won't leave the office until you ring back and tell me the door has opened and you've had a Bible study. She said, you mean that? He said, yeah, sure. Hung up. Five long hours later, the phone rang. And this is what she said. She was crying on the other end of the phone. Pastor, you will not believe what happened. 
tell me, make it quick because he's hungry and I bet you're hungry too. She said, I started praying. My nicest prayer that my mum taught me, nothing happened. Then I got upset and I opened my eyes and I argued with God and I said, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve it. But would you open that door? I need to give a Bible study. Pavel said, that's the way to pray, from the heart. Pastor, while I was talking to God, the door opened. And so she sprinted across. And the guy who opened the door was big, ponytail, black leather jacket. And he put some rubbish in the bin there. And she ran over and she said, can you let me in? Why? Because I have to deliver a Bible study to apartment 14 and they're not answering the bell. I'll just leave it at the door. And he said, if they're not answering, I'm not supposed to let you in. And I'm very frustrated with you. And she said, why? You don't even know me. Well, I've asked for a Bible study before and no one ever came. So I said to him, she's telling Pavel this, okay, you can have this one. And he said, but I don't know how to study. I never studied the Bible, so come in and teach me. And she said, I told him, no, the pastor said I just had to knock and give the DVD the first time. He answered, lady, you just offered me a Bible study. I've never looked at a Bible. I don't know how to study the Bible. You have to teach me. And Pavel was all ears by this stage. And he said, what did you do? She said, I went into his apartment and he told me to wait a couple of minutes and he disappeared. Then he came back into the room and he brought several more people, all with leather jackets, some with ponytails. It seemed to her that they were part of a motorcycle gang. He said to them, guys, last week at the bar, we talked about how all the drugs are killing us. Some of us have been doing them for 40 years and we need to stop. I went home and prayed for the first time in my life. I said, if there is a God in heaven... He should send an angel to help us give up drugs. And God sent an angel. Now sit down and listen to her. Pastor, the girl said, I told them, I'm a drug addict just like you. Showed the marks. Then she said, here's what the pastor told me this morning. I shouldn't focus on myself or my sins, but rather focus on Jesus, his forgiveness, his power to transform. The pastor also said that if I call on Jesus, he'll work on me. She was already preaching and she was on fire, Pavel said. She was happy and excited. Pastor, she continued, we we started the Bible study DVD. Nobody moved for half an hour. Some of them started to cry, big men crying. They said, this is the greatest thing we have ever heard can you come back next week and then Pavel said what she said next he will never forget pastor this is the best day of my life so many times I wanted to kill myself now I really want to live now let me tell you the good news I did drugs at 9 o'clock this morning. Now it's 5.30. I didn't do drugs for over eight hours and I'm not shaking. I don't have the need or the desire. In fact, I'm so on fire for God that I don't care about drugs. Pavel encouraged her. He said, as long as you pray and serve God and stay with him, You are safe. He is with you. Keep praying. Keep serving. He invited her church the next week um, to share. And he asked her questions, interviewed her. And he said, have you ever taught? No. Have you ever spoken before a crowd? No. Did you give a Bible study last week? Yes. Was it difficult? No. Do you love it? Best day of my life, she said. She told a bit of the story. And he said the real miracle is what was happening in people's lives. Not the radio station, but in people's lives. When people and church families decide to seek God's presence, to pray, to follow his plan and vision, he becomes very real. 
He calls us to a total commitment to know him, walk with him, serve him. Wherever you are, whoever you are, God has a plan for you and for me. Let's stand up for prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much for these stories that show us how you work. Show us your love for people and how you can speak to us when we commit to you and trust you and learn to love you. Help us to keep praying until we have answers, until you make us ready, until you show us your plan. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.